We are back at the Tulsa Arms Show. I'm here with Jim Sapika, head of the NRA Museums. And Jim, this is part two. You've been wandering around the floor here at the Tulsa Arms Show. Love coming here to do Curator's Corner because you never know what Jim's going to show up with next. So this is what we're, a little subtitle thing we're calling Weird Nine Millimeters Part Two. So who do we have here and what do we have? Jack Valenti is with us. And in addition to the sales tables, there are educational exhibits here. And he and his buddy always bring the weirdest nine millimeters in the world. I always make it a point to get down and look at their exhibit table. And then he's got two very, very cool ones here. Now I'm a little bit familiar with this one. Tell us about this feller here. Well, this is the uh, pony, yeah. Ivor Johnson, if yeah, I remember correctly. Yeah, yep. And I have seen serial number one, which is in your collection. It, it's on loan to the NRA National Sporting Arms Museum in Springfield, Missouri right now. If I remember correctly, yours is blued. Mine is blued, yeah. This yeah. is still in the white, yeah. and it's serial number D93, the nine standing for nine parabellum, yeah. three being the serial okay. number. Okay, D93, cool. Uh, if I remember correctly, they were working on them in late 70s, early 80s, yeah. and they were going to be released as the smallest nine millimeter at the time. They were never released. Uh, Ivor Johnson had financial problems, manufacturing problems. And it's a, it's a single action design, a lot it's, like the 1911. Right. And I, I show the work on this being done like you in the late 60s, around 1976, 1978. And uh, that gun, would have taken that compact, subcompact nine millimeter uh, market by storm. It's so popular oh, yeah. now, and that's kind of kind of the, the predecessor of all the yeah. pocket nines that are the hot concealed that carry set up right now. Way ahead of its time. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. was ahead of it. And yeah. I think it was because of financial problems that uh, Ivor Johnson uh, went into bankruptcy, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Well, they were making 380s in that size. Yes. Putting the nine so. millimeter cartridge in a pistol that size was, was revolutionary at the time. So the one you have in, on Loan and Museum in this one, they would be prototypes or were they just yeah. never yeah. manufactured? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So that makes them probably a little valuable, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah, you could say that. <laughs> I like to think that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's think all that. I think. The thing. So I what, think there's a cool story behind this one. Now, now this one is a Colt prototype. Uh oh. Um, and it's not marked Colt anywhere on the gun. Interesting. All it is marked is T4. T4. Okay. After World War II, in the late 40s, the U.S. government was going thinking of retiring the old 45, so they had uh, put out contracts to Smith and Wesson, um, a high standard and Colt to come up with new designs. Well, this was one of the designs with Colt, and <clears throat> it has some unique features okay. for, a, for, a club, for a gloved hand. Interesting. Okay. And that's one of, the, one of the features. Now, it also uses a standard Browning magazine. Okay, double stack magazine, double stack 13 magazine. rounds. It is. It's a, a very compact for military sidearm. Yes, it is an alloy frame, Okay. so it is lightweight. But they also made several in, sta in uh, steel frames. Okay. I have seen one. Okay. Uh, this is serial number two. Two of them are in the Springfield Armory Museum. One, serial number one is missing the trigger guard. Okay. Uh, I did not get to see serial number three. Serial number four is in private collections. And serial number five, I have no idea where it is. Incredible, incredible. How'd they do in the, with the military? What was the military's uh, opinion? I, you know, I have, uh, Scott Meadows has just come out with a book. Cool. And in the book, it has all of the documentation of the testing. And you know, I haven't had a chance to read it and study it. But Is it a single action design or double action design? Not single action. Okay, so it's, uh, it's got uh, some high power lines and yes. characteristics yes. to it. The, the double stack magazine. Oh, it's got uh, a kick out of the square, square button. Yeah, There's yeah, button release. yeah. And this was always a neat thing. That's feature. interesting. Yeah. I could see that being good. I could also see that getting caught on a lot of stuff, which is when it was open, which might be the reason why the one's missing it out in the field. So. But it's so great to see these pro things that never were but could have been. But uh, as we talked about before, Jim, these all lead to something. Even in a process like this, when they're coming out with a new firearm, yeah, it leads, yeah, it helps to kind of guide that whole timeline yeah. to what, what actually is, what well, is along made. Well, along with this, then then Colt did come out with a 9mm, but on the 45, 1911 frame size. Right. 
Smith and Wesson came out with their Model 39. Although it didn't get the military contract, it was very popular with police forces. Yeah, for began, a began the line of right. uh, the incredible 39, 59. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The very whole... popular guns, still yeah. popular today. Yeah. Well, Jack, thank you so much for stopping by here in Tulsa and, and uh, showing us some more of these interesting, unique, and weird 9 millimeters. We appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> thanks, Jim. Thanks for being on Curator's Corner. Thank you, man. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jack. Okay.